Welcome to our evening service. Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Let me lead us in prayer. Father God, it is our absolute privilege and honor to worship you as our great triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are pure love, sacrificial love. You are true holiness. There's not even a hint of sin in your character. You are perfect light. There's no shame or error or evil in you. And you are wisdom. And you call us to imitate you, to imitate you in love and holiness and light and wisdom. So help us to do this consistently. We need your power to do so. We need your forgiveness to do so. Thank you that in the salvation provided by Jesus Christ, we are made wise. Help us, therefore, to be wise, not unwise. Help us to be constantly careful in the way we live. And help us to make the most of your gift of time, especially in these evil days. Help us to see gospel opportunities all around us. And help us to learn what your will is, your good, pleasing, and perfect will. Our loving, holy, light-bearing, wise God, help us to imitate you and show and share your love, your holiness, your light, and your wisdom to the world all around us. We ask for this help. In Jesus' name, amen. Tonight we're looking at Ephesians 5, verse 15 to 17, but I want to start at uh, chapter 5, verse 1. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, For because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists of in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For it is light that makes everything visible. This is why it is said, Wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful, then, how you live, not as unwise, but as wise making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. We thank our God for his word. And let's now study that uh, together. We need to think about verses 15 and to 17 within the context of the whole of chapter 5. 
And to get some context, we really need to go back to verse 1. And we need to see there those very important words. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children. We are to know him, and we are to then imitate him. And that's staggering, isn't it? That, that thought of us imitating God. I mean, how? How on earth are we to imitate God? I grew up in an era when Mike Yarwood was famous on TV. Those of us who are older will, will remember him. He was an impressionist, a comedian, an actor, and he imitated people for a living. Politicians, entertainers, uh, sports stars. And he would take something of their voice, something of their physical looks, something of their mannerisms, and he would imitate them, and he made a living out of it. And he was very good at it. But how are we supposed to imitate God? Well, the verses that follow from verse 1 gives us lots of clues about how we are to imitate God. Verse 1 tells us what we're to do, imitate God. Verses 2 to 17 tells us what it actually looks like. And then verses 18 to 20 tells us how we are able to do it. And that's for next week. And let me give you a little clue. It means being filled with the Holy Spirit. So how do we imitate God? Well, we are to love because God is love. Verse 2, and live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. We're to imitate the God of love. We see this love of God, especially in Jesus, a sacrificial act of love, a fragrant offering of love. And we're to imitate that kind of love. And in doing so, of course, we imitate God. The aim, of course, is to make us ready for heaven. Because this is not our home, our forever home. We don't belong to this world. We love and we follow a different, better king. And we give ourselves to his kingdom. And we live a life worthy of our calling from him. So love is one way that we can imitate God. Holiness is another way. Verses 3 to 7. God is holy. And we are to imitate God when we live a holy life. That means there should not even be a hint of sexual immorality. No impurity. No greed. No obscenity, no foolish talk, no coarse joking. Verses 3 and 4. There should be no place for these things, no acceptance of these things, no tolerance of these things. Because we are heavenly children living temporarily here on earth, and we should have no time and no space for these things. Don't be surprised by this clear call to imitate God's holiness. And don't fear the call. It's a gracious call. It's a beautiful call. And what is also pointed out in these verses is that we shouldn't be deceived by people who by life or by lip set a bad example. Verses 6 and 7, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. It's possible for ourselves to deceive ourselves, and it's possible to be deceived by others. You see, there are tests of whether we are truly children of God. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children. We should, as children, be people of love and be people of holiness and people of light. That's the third thing that we looked at last week uh, in verses 8 to 14. He is light, and therefore we are to imitate his light. Think blazing whiteness. Think awesome light. Verse 8, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. So yes, hey, we once were darkness. Now we are light in the Lord. We live as children of light. We imitate God, who is light. We don't imitate the world, which, of course, is darkness. We imitate God. So do you see how we are to imitate God? Love, holiness, 
light. And the fourth one, of course, is wisdom, verses 15 to 17, really, which is our passage tonight. And we have three headings, from one from each of the three verses, verse 15, verse 16, verse 17. And I suppose the first verse, verse 15, tells us that we're to be wise and we're therefore to live. We're to live wisely. Verse 15, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. Now, how many parents have said something like verse 15 to their children uh, over the generations? Multiple times, uh, I would suggest. Be very careful out there. That reminds me, of course, of uh, my youth. Thought of Mike Yarwood. What about Hill Street Blues? Some of you, again, will remember Hill Street Blues. The sergeant each morning uh, in the cop brief or the roll call would get the officers together, and and he always concluded uh, with the signature line, let's be careful out there. Let's be careful out there. Every time, and every time he seemed to catch the men unawares, he would call it back, oh, one last thing. Let's be careful out there. It's good COVID-19 advice, I would suggest. Possibly the wisest words ever spoken on television because it does fit in very well with verse 15. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. Yes, we ought to be wise. Because God is wise, and we're to imitate him. It means we're, we ought to be skillful. We, we, we need to be on guard. We need to look out closely, carefully, so that we um, don't stumble. We don't fall. We're, we're wisely living. The idea is uh, exactness, precision, accuracy in the way we live. It's the wise way to live. It is the godly way to live. God is wise and we are to imitate his wisdom. Now, of course, it's a present imperative, meaning that we must pay continual attention to how we are living. Constantly careful, I suppose, is the way we could put it. Constantly careful in all our living. But if truth be told, of course, we know that very often we're not careful, but we are more often care less. One writer put like this, it was quite um, straight, and I, I thought I would share it with you. Too many of us are spiritual sluggards living sloppy lives. Spiritual sluggards living sloppy lives. We resist holiness rather than resist sin. And instead of being on the narrow path, we want to jump over the hedge and Get on to the broad road. Instead of being with the few who are God's people, we, we, we tend to want to follow the, the many who are the world's people. You know, for example, parents sometimes can be careless in the way they raise their God-given children, their covenant children. So academic success or, or sporting achievement are often higher up the priority list than, for instance, spiritual maturity. And it ought not to be. That's careless living, careless parenting. So wise living is careful, not careless. We've got to be very careful. Be very careful, verse 15. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. It is so easy for us to be careless in our affluent and our media-saturated culture. We have money, so we can... We can buy any kind of satisfaction, and, and we have all kinds of avenues to be entertained. So it's easy to be careless, and it's hard to be careful. But notice the way that uh, Paul writes this. He's pointing out here that God has made us wise. He said, don't live as unwise, but as wise, because we have been made wise. And we see this, this contrast so many times in Ephesians. You know, we were dead, but now we are alive. We were darkness, but now we are light. We were separated from God, but now we are in Christ. We were foolish, but now we are wise. 
Now, the world, of course, thinks we're absolute fools, singing to a God who's not real, uh, praying to a God who's a figment of our imagination, believing in a heaven that doesn't exist. The world says we're fools. And God says we are wise. We're wise. God says, I have made you wise. You have true wisdom. I have opened up your eyes and your ears and your hearts and have revealed wisdom to you. So live not as unwise, but as wise. So tonight, we might not be able to put our hands up and say we are smart or we are intelligent, but we can say we are wise because God has made us wise through the gospel. We have received the wisdom of God. We know the one who has borne our sin. We know the one who has saved us for time and eternity. We know the one who has set us free in true wisdom, the wisdom of a wise God. So this true wisdom affects every aspect of our lives. What we think, what we believe, how we behave, how we conduct ourselves. We are to live wisely. And this requires deliberate, disciplined action. I mean, anybody can be a fool. We're born foolish, and we live our lives as foolish people until the moment we're made wise by the gospel. That's why tonight there, can be, there are many intelligent people who are absolute fools. But it takes the spirit-filled, born-again Christian, dedicated and disciplined, to be wise. Notice here the not as, uh, but as wise. The, the contrast, not as, but as. Not as unwise, but as wise. There's a clear break, isn't there, between our past life apart from Christ and our new life in Christ. The contrast is very clear. Too many of us, of course, sadly, want to continue our old life of being unwise, living unwise lives. It, it should not be so. It does not need to be so. It ought not to be so. We reject our past unwise living. We jettison our past behavior. We now are filled with the Holy Spirit and we live accordingly. We enter a brand new way of wise living. A, a complete mental overhaul has occurred. A new set of values, a new motivation. Yeah, we can imitate God. Love, holiness, light, wisdom. Be wise and live wisely. Secondly, be wise and make the most of his gift of time. Verse 16, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Making the most of every opportunity as the idea there of redeeming the time that we've been given. God says, I, I've given you time, and I don't want you to waste it. I've given you opportunities. Don't waste it. I've given you a life. Don't waste it. The idea behind every opportunity is an appointed time or a fixed occasion. In other words, it's really kingdom time rather than clock time, if you can think of the the difference between those two things. Colossians 4 verse 5 is the kind of parallel passage um, in, to the, uh, in the epistle to the Colossians. It goes like this. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. So in both Ephesians and Colossians, wisdom is the context along with ministry or evangelism. And it takes wisdom to recognize that the days are evil. And it takes wisdom to make the most of gospel opportunities when they come along. So we've got to be wise. The, the unwise, the lost, are oblivious. They are morally numb to what is right and to what is wrong, to what is important and to what is insignificant, to what is good and to what is bad. They, they're just oblivious to it all. It takes wisdom, in a sense, to recognize evil and sin and the implications of evil and sin. And it takes wisdom to know 
how to respond. Don't waste opportunities. Don't waste time. Think of the time that we spend on Google seeking information that's of little or no value. Think of the time spent or maybe wasted on social media. That's very easy for me to say because I'm really not on it, but John Piper wrote this. One of the great uses of social media will be to prove at the last day that prayerlessness was not for lack of time. Oh, quite penetrating that, isn't it? One of the great uses of social media will be to prove at the last day that prayerlessness was not for lack of time. Think of time wasted on phones or YouTube, except, of course, our channel. But what about iTunes and Netflix and other streaming services? Think of the time we waste. Now, it's right for us to relax at times and enjoy things. Of course it is. But let us stop wasting these kingdom moments that God gives to us, these opportunities in these evil days. Verse 16, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. The days are evil, aren't they? And it takes wisdom to understand just how evil these days are. If, of course, if you're unsaved, then you know, it's nothing evil, just that's the way things are. But for those of us who are Christians, we can see evil when it's all around us. Now, some of us are tempted to um, look back to the good old days of your, but actually, they were evil as well, and they had their own troubles and problems. We live today, and we need wisdom to spot the evil that is around today. I mean, last week, Alex mentioned the, the, the evil of abortion. But what about the, the evil of celebrating homosexual marriage, for instance? What, what about the evil of blasphemy, the evil of profanity? What about the normal, everyday evil acts of greed and gossip and grumbling? See, the days are evil, aren't they? And you and I are just, we're sucked into it. We're influenced by it. But we have opportunity to speak into and witness into these evil days. So let's make the most of these God-given opportunities that have been presented to us. Let's not be foolish. Let's be wise. God warns us about the danger that's all around us, the evil that's all around us, and then he invites us to live wisely. So be wise and use your opportunities to evangelize the lost and to glorify God. In those few but exciting moments that comes our way, but also in the many mundane moments of life. We, we ought to be, we can be wise and take the opportunities that are presented to us to glorify God and to evangelize. Wasting the gift of time. Wasting the gift of time insults the giver of time. Verse 16, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Many of the commentators and preachers um, quote Jonathan Edwards on, on, on this particular verse. As a young man, he wrote 70 resolutions that he sought to apply to his own life. One of them went like this. Resolved. Here, I've put it on the screen for you. Resolved never to lose one moment of time, but to improve it in the most profitable way I possibly can. Isn't that a good resolution? Resolve never to lose one moment of time, but to improve it in the most profitable way I possibly can. So be wise and make the most of his gift of time. And lastly, be wise and learn what his will is. Verse 17. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Again, we see that we ought to be wise. God is wise, and when we imitate him, we will be wise. Or in this case, he puts it the, the opposite way. Don't be foolish. Understand what the Lord's will is. Walking wisely means we walk in the will of God. To fail to know and to do God's will is foolishness. Therefore, do not be foolish. But understand 
what the Lord's will is. Now, I think it's clearly implied here that God's will is not a deep, dark secret that only a few get to know about. The will of God is patently clear. And anyone who does not seek it, anyone who does not want it, anyone who does not obey it, is a fool. And we're called not to be foolish. The word understand there is quite interesting. It carries the idea of assembling together facts into a whole, like, like bringing pieces of a, a, a jigsaw puzzle together to make a beautiful picture. You know, therefore, do not be foolish, but understand, bring it together, all the different pieces, and, and make a beautiful picture of God's will. Do it. Understand it. Do it. It's another one of these present imperatives. It means it's a command that we are to make as a continual practice. We, we keep understanding what the Lord's will is. So, how do I know what the Lord's will is? By reading, by meditating on, by memorizing, by studying, by applying the Word of God. Our call to worship just a few moments ago was Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. And, and there we see details of his good, pleasing, and perfect will. You'll notice at the end of verse 2. His good, pleasing, and perfect will is that you and I, that we be living sacrifices to him. Let's just start with that one little thought. As somebody once put, the problem with a living sacrifice is that it keeps crawling off the altar. But we're talking about real discipleship. The basis of the discipleship is his great mercy. Notice that in verse 1 there. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, we are his by mercy. The character of our discipleship is that we be holy and pleasing and living sacrifices. To offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. This is his will for you and for me, for us as a church. The demands of discipleship are stated there in verse 2. Negatively, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. We say no to the world. Positively, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And the effect of all of that is that then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, perfect will. Fits in well, doesn't it, with verse 17. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. There's enough context, content, there's enough challenge in Romans 12, 1 and 2 to keep us all busy for a very, very long time. And then there's all the rest of Scripture that reveals his will in his word. So, my friends, in these dark, dangerous, evil days, let us be imitators of God as dearly loved children. Imitate his love. Imitate his holiness. Imitate his light. Imitate his wisdom. In other words, Let's imitate Jesus, who's the perfect example of love and holiness and light and wisdom. You see, it's all in him, by him, and for him. And next Sunday evening, we will see how we can do this. Be filled with the Spirit. In the meantime, until we study that together, may we be wise. May we, indeed we be love, holiness, light, and wisdom. God bless us in these days. Father, we pray for each other that we might know your care and love, that we might see you in all your beauty and power, your love, your holiness, your light, and your wisdom. And may you give us the grace and the power, filling us with your Spirit to imitate your love, your holiness, your light, and your wisdom. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.